Nice to see everyone that's managed out uh, this afternoon. Thanks for coming along, especially Anne, and it's uh, Anne's birthday, so very happy birthday to Anne. Uh, good to see you here. I know that uh, 40 is a big milestone, so it's good to see you out in your 40th. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to turn to the Word of God, to Revelation, please, the book of Revelation, and uh, chapter number 17 uh, this, this afternoon. As some of you know, we do a little kind of message on Facebook, and Yvonne does a recording of that, and uh, uh, we were speaking, I uh, was doing it last night, and uh, Yvonne handed me the Bible and turned it to Revelation in chapter 17. She knew exactly where I was going to speak from. Uh, we've been doing a lot of Revelation, uh, so uh, we're in Revelation again uh, this evening. It is a very interesting book, and uh, there's so much in it to think about. Now, it's a strange section we're reading from. It's a section that deals with a subject called Babylon, chapter 17 and verse number 1, uh, which says, And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying to me, Come hither, I will show to thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the, the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-coloured beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And just a verse over in the 21st chapter, please, <coughs> of Revelation. Revelation 21 and verse 21. Uh, those verses I've read, I'm sure, are probably not hugely familiar to us. Maybe sound a bit obscure, a bit strange. But these verses, this verse here in Revelation 21, 21, I'm sure will ring a bell with all of us. Um, verse 21 of Revelation 21. And the 12 gates were 12 perils. And every, every several gate was of one peril and the street of the city was pure gold and, it were, as it were, transparent glass. And from that verse, of course, we have that often used phrase about the pearly gates. Well, that's where it comes from, Revelation chapter number 21. So let's just ask, shall we, for God's help and blessing uh, this afternoon. Now, Father, we have opened thy word uh, in expectation for we know, Father, that thy word is living and powerful. It's able to speak to us. Some of these verses we've read uh, might seem strange and, and perhaps our Father deal with very difficult subjects, but we, we we're confident that thy Holy Spirit is able to take up the inspired word of God and to uh, speak to our hearts. We're all different. We've come from different backgrounds. We uh, have different needs, different thoughts that we've come uh, in our minds this afternoon to this place. But we know ultimately, Father, that we are all in essence the same. We're all created in thy image for thy glory. We're all created, our Father, ultimately to enjoy a living relationship with thee. And there is but one of two destinies for all of us, heaven and hell. And we pray, Father, that uh, thy Holy Spirit would speak to each of us personally, individually, and we pray, Father, that it would be that living appreciation and experience of Jesus Christ. So be with us, our Father, this afternoon. We pray, and we pray for help in the name and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, these verses in Revelation 17 are difficult. They might seem a bit strange, but the basic message of them is, is actually quite straightforward. And uh, the opening verse of this uh, section here, verse number one, uh, points us to the reality of the destiny that God has for us and the potential for utter catastrophe and disaster in each of our hearts. Did you notice that something strange happens in verse number one in Revelation 17? Something that probably has never happened to you. It certainly never happened to me. Here's John, and in verse one, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me. John has an interview with an angel. Now, that's pretty unusual. Uh, maybe I can't relate to that. Maybe you can't relate to that either. 
but it does underpin something of fundamental importance. It, it points to the fact that you and I are created for something far beyond the ordinary. John had an interest in what the angel had to say, and the angel had an interest in communi communicating something to John. John was just not some kind of a machine. He wasn't just created to be born and to die, but there was something within the soul of John that was able to grasp the eternal and the divine. And right the way through the book of Revelation, John is transported, and in a sense he transports us with him into the presence of God. It's how Revelation opens up. Begins in the ordinary mundane Isle of Patmos, but by the time you hit chapter 4 of Revelation, John is passed, passed through an open door into the presence of God. He's in heaven. He's got this capacity for communication with the divine, with God. That is the destiny that God has for each and every one of us. And so often I, I see in the hearts of men and women a sense of utter despair, a sense of utter uh, and, and complete emptiness, a, a deep sorrow and sadness. And perhaps, perhaps the real source of the problem is this, that the purpose for which God has created them has never been experienced and never realized. They're living a life that is full of utter emptiness and that ultimate purpose for which God has created them for his glory, for a living relationship with himself, is not there. The very core of their being is empty. And it doesn't matter how much else you fill it full, it's still empty. It reminds me so much of the kids when they were younger, up until about the age of 25 anyway. You know, they would love to fill their, their, their stomachs full of rubbish. Full of sweeties. And then you, the, the dinner goes down and they can't eat their dinner. Why can't they eat their dinner? It's no great mystery, is it? Full of rubbish. And we need that substance to our life. We can't fill our lives full of rubbish. We need to fill our souls and our hearts full of living meat. Living bread, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about it in John chapter number 6. Living water, he speaks about it in John 4. Something that truly satisfies. You find it through the scriptures, of course, that Man's created for this. Psalm 42, uh, David speaks about it. He has a sense of it. Maybe it's a sense that you and I have. Psalm 42, verse number one. As the heart, as the deer pants after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O oh my God. David, David, now David, by the way, isn't just down in his luck. He's not just looking for something to entertain him or, or fill up a life that's really pretty pathetic. David's got everything, absolutely everything. He's the king, he's got palace, he's got an empire. The best empire that Israel has ever seen. They still stamp their coins with the symbols of David today because that was the glory of the Israeli empire, David. He had it all, armies, power, wealth. In fact, he had, he had so much gold and silver, he didn't know what to do with it. You read about that in the books of Kings. He was really desperate to build a, a temple for God. He had that much stuff. He had everything in his life. But he had something, there was this thirst and this hunger beyond the purely material. As the deer pants after the water brook, so pants my soul after thee, O God. He knew that he was created for something far better than this passing world. He knew that he was created with a destiny greater than death. He had a destiny that had a desire after God. And it's only in that that you and I can be satisfied. The prophet Jeremiah uh, in chapter 2, verse 13 of his prophecy, uh, condemns his people. Jeremiah 2, 13, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Jeremiah recognizes that the people have gone the wrong way. They've gone for things that will never satisfy them. When their real satisfaction is found in the God that created them, in his image, after his likeness, for his glory and his eternal purpose. What if you have God? Maybe that would change our Scottish government, our UK government, our European government's view of the value of life. If they appreciated that we were created in God's image for his glory. We're not disposable. We're not destroyable. We can't. And, and Jeremiah has a sense of it. Uh, David has a sense of it. And John here has an experience of it in Revelation 17 and 1. 
Uh, there is that part of the human soul, the human psyche, the human spirit that connects with God, connects with God. And it's only in that connection that a soul can be truly satisfied. Now, that, in essence, is the destiny of man, uh, that connection with God. But the next few verses from verses 2 down to about verse 4, 5 uh, contains a disaster. Uh, there is a design that God has put into his creation for a living relationship with humanity. Uh, but in these verses, uh, John describes an entity called Babylon. Babylon is really the kind of sanitized face of Satanism in the book of Revelation. It's the public relations part of of the satanic empire. It's the way that Satan distracts people in the book of Revelation, Babylon. And Satan's technique for bringing destiny into disaster is the same right the way through the, the Bible. It's not particularly unique to Revelation 17. He's always done it this way. And in Revelation 17, what you see is that he's going to do it this way for the whole world. He's going to bring this whole world into the pit. And he's going to drag everybody with them if you let him. And he's going to do it in these four ways. These are the four steps to disaster that Satan has planned for this world. We might be able to relate to them. Look at how Satan deals with the human soul dragging it into the pit. Verse 2, uh, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. In making sure that a soul heads into a lost eternity, making sure that a soul never enjoys a relationship with God and is lost forever, the first satanic um, attack is that of distraction. He's going to get your eye off the ball. Now, I'm, not, I'm not really any good at football. I've, um, I've, uh, uh, there was always an odd number in my class at school. And I was always putting the goals. <laughs> that was after they used to fight about me. No, you have Stuart. No, you have Stuart. No, you have Stuart. That's how good I was at football, right? Uh, but distraction, I do know this. I do know this from listening to other people. You need to keep your eye on the ball if you're going to be any good at the game. I could keep my eye on the ball, but can you do anything else with it, actually? Uh, you've got to keep your eye on the ball. And Satan is the master of distraction in verse 2 of Revelation 17. He's going to get your eye off that ball. He's going to get your eye off of the eternal, and he'll give you whatever you want, as we'll see in a minute, just to make sure that you don't think about your soul, you don't think about meeting God, you don't think about your sin, and you don't prepare for eternity. He'll give you anything that you want to keep you from that. Distraction. Distraction from God and distraction from his values, from his laws, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, that's sexual immorality, sexual relationships out with marriage, that's sinful, it's under the Ten Commandments, broken Ten Commandments. So here's Satan and he's enticing people to himself. Just abandon God. It's a repetition of what happened at the beginning of the book of Genesis. Now, there's something in this, by the way, it's quite interesting. Um, a lot of people, as I speak with them and have spoken with them over the years, are quite happy there's a God and quite happy there's a heaven. And they're quite happy they're going there. And the reason that they're quite happy they're going there is not because they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died for them at the cross, but because they're trying hard and they're keeping commandments. Now, this is a common idea. It's a kind of post-Christian idea. It's a kind of thing that came from a misunderstanding of the Bible. Uh, the idea that God, for example, has given us 10 commandments, there's, there's a lot more than that, but, but let's just take it as being 10. And the thinking goes along these lines. Um, I'm pretty good because I've kept seven of them, or eight of them, or nine of them. I, I, and, and I reckon that the harder I keep them and, and the better I am according to them, the closer I am to heaven. I'm trying really hard. I'm doing better than you are, <laughs> and I'm going to get there. That seems reasonable. Um, there's a funny wee verse in the book of James. I'm going to read it to you. I've pondered about this verse for years, and I couldn't get my head around it until recently. I, I kind of worked out what it means. James 2.10 says this, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. Now, I've read that over the years. John, uh, James is speaking about the, the commandments. And he's saying, listen, if you break one of those commandments, you've broken them all. 
I always thought that was wrong. That doesn't make any sense. Are you? For example, if you break the commandment, thou shalt not kill, surely that doesn't mean to say you've broken the commandment, thou shalt not steal. I mean, they're different commandments, aren't they? Or if I say uh, the, the commandment, thou shalt not uh, take the name of the Lord your God in vain, so I, I commit the sin of blasphemy, that, that doesn't mean to say that I necessarily have committed the sin of murder, does it? That doesn't. I, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember my granny um, speaking about the electric lights, right? Um, because in my granny's day, she had electric lights as opposed to other kinds of lights, the gas lights. And, and I, I just kind of remember my earlier days that this was almost a novelty in some people's houses, the electric lights. And lights, lights are triggered by a switch, uh, on off. You call that a digital system. You either have it or you don't have it, a digital system. Your lights are either on or they're off. And then as I got a bit older and you went into folks' houses, you saw something else, something quite fancy. And instead of them having a switch for the lights, some of them had a knob. That was quite new in the 80s and 90s. It was a dimmer switch. And you didn't just have a, a light that went on or off. We could have a, a wee bit on or a wee bit off or a big bit on or a big bit off. And maybe some of you have got plenty of money and you've got these dimmer switches. I don't know. We, we don't. But... You know, you could you could have oh, you could have a whole shade of colours, a whole shade of, of, of light. The law is not like that. It's not analog. That's an analog scale, more or less. The law is digital. It's on or it's off. You don't have shades of grey in between. You either keep the whole thing, that's the deal. <laughs> you either keep the whole thing and thereby meet God's perfect standard, or you miss out on a bit of it, in which case you don't meet his perfect standard, and you're lost. It's either or. And so what James is saying, listen, if you trip up on one of these commandments, then you're lost. And here's Satan working away here, distracting men and women from God's standards, his law, his his, his, his moral law, his, his Old Testament law, he's tripping them up here at sexual immorality in Revelation 17 and 2, and now they're down. They're, 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 they've broken that commandment. Sin has come into their life, and they're lost. Distraction. And then he moves on to his second attack, which is the distrust and disobedience of God. Verse 3 of Revelation 17. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy. Let's have a go at God. What a master stroke of Satan. First of all, he sows sin into the heart and into the, the souls of men and women. And now we have a guilty conscience before God. And what could be what could be more reasonable than just turning our back on the God that we've got a guilty conscience with? We don't want to deal with God, so we, we just blank him. And that's tragic, of course, because it's that God who alone has the solution to our problems. It's that God who alone is able to save. It's that God who has given provision for our sin. It's only in coming to know the God of heaven through his son, Jesus Christ, that there's any hope for any of us. Not in keeping his laws. We can't do it. We can't climb up high enough with these laws to get into heaven. It's only in the cross of Jesus Christ. And as you go down through Revelation chapter 17, the Lord Jesus is introduced to us in at least two ways. Verse 6, he's spoken of as Jesus. Later on in the chapter, he's spoken of as the Lamb. Verse 14, what wonderful glimpse of Jesus Christ we have. He's the Jesus. Jehovah saves, that's, that, that's what that word means. God saves. You're going to turn from him? His name's Jesus. God saves you. You're going to turn from your salvation? Are you going to turn from the Savior that died on the cross for you? Are you going to turn from the Lamb? He's not a lion here in Revelation 17. He's a Lamb. He's the one whose blood was shed and who was nailed and crucified for you. Are you going to turn from him? He's our only hope. <laughs> so Satan, first of all, is going to distract us. Then secondly, he's going to show, he's going to sow the seeds of distrust and blasphemy against God. And then thirdly, he's going to deceive and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold, precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations, filthiness of her fornication. What does all that mean? Wow. What it means is Satan will give you whatever you want. 
you want to, he'll give you it. Um, this is a kind of scary verse in many ways. Babylon, the satanic system, is seen as a woman, and she has a certain kind of a, a clothing on. She's clothed in purple and scarlet. Now, that's strange. There's only one other person in the Bible who is clothed like that, scarlet and purple. That's the Lord Jesus. Uh, that's the Lord Jesus at Calvary. As he heads towards Calvary, a robe is put upon him. Uh, Matthew tells us it's scarlet. Mark tells us it's purple. So he's clothed in scarlet and purple. And here's the woman. Here's Satan's alternative. And we'll make him look maybe a bit like the Lord Jesus. Yeah. And, and we're going to jam pack her full of everything that you could possibly wish for in your life. What do you want? Leisure, treasure, pleasure? Uh, you want prosperity? You want money? You want likes? You want popularity? Well, she's arrayed in purple and scarlet, the marks of power and authority, decked with gold and precious stones, plenty of wealth, jam pack full of wealth. Is that what, is that what you want? We can fill our lives full of it. We can have busy lives, maybe pleasant lives, maybe pleasurable lives. And where's it going? Well, she's got the answer for that as well. She's decked with pearls. Pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand. Pearls. The other place you will find pearls in the book of Revelation are those gates into heaven. <laughs> but these pearls ain't going nowhere. They just look the part. Uh, these perils are good. Satan will give you everything and, and fill you with everything and the world will fill you with everything, but it ain't going nowhere. Going nowhere fast. You sometimes see it, don't you, on the uh, some of your news feeds or some of the television programmes and there's the multi-billionaires. I remember there was a religious leader in India he used to collect Rolls Royces, you know, 150 Rolls Royces he had in his garage. I thought, well, how can you use them? You can't, he just collects them, you know, they're just there for looking at, don't go anywhere. <laughs> these multi-billionaires, they collect Lamborghinis and you see pictures of them in Saudi Arabia and they're all these lined up, at least things. wouldn't mind just one of them, maybe having a wee run up and down and you come that kind of, they don't do any of them. Don't even take them a, a, a run down to ask that come that. She looks the part, but it's useless. It's going nowhere. It's a life that's filled with everything you could possibly want in your life. At the end of it, you're going to give it back. At the end of it, Satan is going to do with you and I what he did with uh, Judas Iscariot. Remember? What do you like, Judas? Silver? I'll give you some silver. But I'll give you a whole bag full of silver. There you go. 30 pieces of silver. But Satan, you see, was outsmarting the Judas Iscariot because Satan knew that that silver he gave to Judas Iscariot was just on loan. He was going to get it back. What a deal? A soul for 30 pieces of silver, and then you get a refund on your 30 pieces of silver for Judas in a state of despair, knowing that he had missed salvation, he had missed Christ, his only saviour. He goes out, he hangs himself, and he loses his 30 pieces of silver. So Revelation 17 is a section that it gives us an insight into who we are, as to what God desires for us. Our destiny is a living relationship with himself. And it points out the pattern that Satan uses, a pattern that leads to utter disaster. It's one in which he begins with distraction. He goes on to distrust and undermining God, and he brings us to a place of deception. And all the time, all the time we're missing the one saviour that's able to save us. We're missing the Jesus of Revelation 17. We're missing the only hope, a saviour that died for us at the cross of Calvary. We're missing God's plan of salvation, the Lamb. We're missing the eternal love of God. And perhaps that conscience that you and I have that's offended God, we just feel that maybe the last person we want to deal with is God. The only person that can save us is his son, Jesus Christ. The only person who's able to forgive those sins and bring us into his heaven and open those gates into eternity is his son, Jesus Christ, a son who loved us, who died for us, and who offers this afternoon salvation by a simple step of faith that God loved this world so much that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him need not perish but have everlasting life. Let's pray. Our Father, we do come into thy presence this afternoon. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. 
We thank Thee, our Father, for Thy Word. At times, uh, some of these uh, passages in the Scriptures seem difficult, but we thank Thee, our Father, that they're full of Christ. They point us, our Father, to our eternal need of the Lord Jesus. Help us, our Father.